It's really a pleasure for me today to introduce Mark Leonowski um, to speak about merit selection of judges. Uh, I got, was so pleased when they opened Roger Williams Law School in 1993 because many of us felt that Rhode Island really needed a law school and uh, it could not have come at a more opportune time because as you know, 1993 was the year of the Supreme Court scandal where the second Chief Justice in seven years was um, really pressured to retire or to, to step, uh, step down from the bench under this uh, impeachment pressure. Um, and so we had our, our Common Cause had its first annual meeting, at its annual meeting that year at the law school, and we were probably one of the first. And I would have been trying to think when we actually met. Well, you may remember, because I don't exactly. But in any event, a number of people from the law, I, I think our hopes for the law school have been fulfilled. Um, and, and I won't talk about separation of powers today, but they did a terrific symposium on separation of powers uh, that helped to get that issue Established as a credible issue in the state and on merit selection of judges. Uh, so my joy is to today is to introduce to you uh, Dean Michael Yelnowski. And when I met him, of course, he was not Dean. He was just a, a young law professor teaching labor uh, studies and uh, contracts and things of that kind. Uh, but the other person from Roger Williams who will not be uh, able to be with us is Carl Bogus, who was the spark plug on separation of powers. And the intellectual firepower that we gained from having faculty at the law school participate in the reform movement, I think really was convincing to many people that this was not just an amateurish effort. Uh, so I'm very grateful both to Michael uh, and to Carl. So uh, I first met him 23 years ago when he was a young and he didn't have any gray at that point. And, <laughs> this is true. And, and my hair was red at that time. Uh, and, and he was not even married yet. Now he has twins who are starting college. 16. They're 16. 16. Okay. So uh, they had their uh, <coughs> name that's here. Twins. I'm a member of the synagogue here, so uh, it's nice to be here. But it, but it was, it was uh, amazing when he came forward. We had been working for years on merit selection of judges, and everybody said it will never happen in Rome. <coughs> and then along came the, the scandal in the summer of 1993, uh, and Michael got involved in the, uh, the effort to make this reform, and then chaired the committee. A professor from Brown, Tom Banchoff, had been had been chairing the committee, and then Michael took over, and was in, involved for a number of years of the implementation. So we'll hopefully get to talk about some of that. We'll talk for about twenty minutes, half an hour, and then take your questions. So feel free to write down any questions that you have. Um, before we jump into the merit selection thing. Would you tell us a little bit about your conscience, your character, how were the formative influences that made you care about these things, and maybe that got you into law school and to wanting to teach law? Sure. First of all, I want to thank you, Phil, for having me. It's always so great to see you, and uh, Phil has been a big, um, a real inspiration to me and so many uh, people who have taken the time to try to improve uh, the state of Rhode Island's uh, government. Um, and it's also great to be uh, uh, at, at Bethel. It's, it's, uh, um, I am not Jewish, but my children and my wife are, uh, and this has been a very welcoming uh, place for me. So it's really nice to be here. Um, Talk good and loud so everybody can hear you. So, so um, absolutely. Um, so, uh, let me let me answer the question uh, directly. Um, 
my grandfather was a coal miner and his son, my father, uh, was fortunate enough to join the army and serve in World War II and survive and go to college on the GI Bill. Uh, he was the first in his family to do that and eventually became um, a research pharmacologist. Um, but my father always talked about working people and the difficulties that working people had. He had a, he had a big heart. He was a very empathetic uh, man and never sort of left behind, uh, I don't think, that feeling uh, of what it was like to be on, on the edge, uh, living uh, paycheck to paycheck, which, which his parents um, did. So my father was a big influence. Um, my mother uh, was very involved in the Episcopal Church uh, and did a tremendous amount of service work through uh, the church. I have older sisters. I'm one of five. Um, I'm 56. Um, my sisters are five, six years older than I am. They were old enough to be involved in um, the civil rights movement, uh, and I saw uh, some of that as a, as a younger child. Uh, so they were great role models uh, for me. Um, and I was going to be a secondary school teacher. That's what I thought I wanted to do. Uh, and I did my student teaching, and I got chewed up and spit out by <laughs> ninth graders. Uh, and after about a month uh, of doing my student teaching, bought an LSAT prep book and took the, uh, took the LSAT and uh, went to law school, and one thing led to another. Um, I clerked for a federal judge in Philadelphia who had a very long uh, record of public service and made it a priority in his life, both his professional and his personal life. Um, and then I had the very good fortune to be able to sort of marry my interest in uh, teaching and my uh, interest in law and social justice um, by uh, teaching at Villanova Law School uh, outside of Philadelphia and then when the law school opened uh, 23 years ago, I was a member of the founding faculty. So, um, and the ethic, uh, I think, of a lot of people who teach law for a living um, is to use some of the freedom that we have in these terrific jobs uh, to try to influence public policy, to help people. Um, we have clinical programs at our law school that offer services, legal services, free legal services to indigent clients. Um, it, it's part of who we are as an institution and uh, it's, it's been a great privilege to be able to be, um, to be affiliated with an organization uh, like that and to have met people like Phil uh, and others who are shining examples of what can be done if people of goodwill put their minds to it. So would you share your recollections, just coming to Rhode Island, of what you saw in 1993? Here's the Chief Justice in trouble, and um, you're just starting the law school, and the Chief Justice is, is um, in the paper every day, front page headlines, uh, the, the, some of you remember that the original story was uh, the making of an empire and how Maddie Smith, the Speaker of the House, became the clerk of the court after appointing, getting his um, protege uh, or friend, Thomas Fay, appointed Chief Justice. And that all exploded with a very fine investigative series by the Providence Journal in the summer of 1993. They won a Pulitzer Prize for that. 
Um, would you reflect a little bit on what you saw happening as you arrived and what you thought about it and maybe what you and others at the law school were saying to each other about what you saw happening? So there, there are two things that I remember. Um, one is, so I, I, I had been, I spent most of my uh, young adulthood um, in the Philadelphia area. And when I was clerking for that federal judge uh, whom I mentioned, um, I had the very good fortune to witness him um, holding a trial uh, of, the, there were three state court judges in Philadelphia who had been accused of taking bribes from the roofers union in return for um, favorable rulings when roofers came before um, the court. And um, a young Eric Holder, uh, from who was then at the public integrity section of the Justice Department, came to Philadelphia to try uh, that case. And this was a case where there were tapes, and uh, these judges were taking pretty small bribes to do pretty significant things, 300 bucks to make sure that a roofer walks if he's brought into court on a DUI, that kind of thing. Um, and there was a, a lawyer uh, from Philadelphia who had um, flipped, essentially, and had gone into the witness protection program and was coming to testify in these cases. So it was very exciting um, for, I was just out of law school, um, for me to, uh, to experience that. Um, so on the one hand, and this is something that I know you talk about and will be talking about in this course, on the one hand, the idea of public corruption and corruption in the judiciary uh, did not shock me. Uh, I also spent some time in Chicago, which is another place <laughs> where there was uh, plenty of uh, political corruption. So on the one hand, uh, it was not a shock to me. Um, what was a shock to me, I think, was um, that it reached the highest levels. Um, that I really hadn't seen before. Um, and the, the coverage of the journal, and this is, you know, this is another thing we could talk about for a very long time, um, the demise of the Providence Journal uh, and their inability to do that kind of reporting can would have a real serious uh, uh, impact on uh, the ability of people to hold government accountable. But that story was just breathtaking in its uh, detail about the secret account that uh, the, um, uh, the former uh, Speaker of the House had set up. And um, so I thought, you know, maybe there's something I could do about this. Maybe I could get involved in this. And this is the second thing that I remember. Um, I called Common Cause uh, because I, I, I think Tom Banshoff may have been quoted in one of the, uh, one of the pieces in the journal. <clears throat> and I called <clears throat> Common Cause and either you answered the phone or, uh, and I can't remember who your assistant was at the time. She was terrific. Um, Gail. Uh, Gail. Uh, put me in, put me through to Phil, and I told him who I was and told him that I was interested in helping if I could. And he said, oh, we're having a meeting tonight. Uh, and sure, so I was in Tom Banshoff's house, I think, um, you know, within months of arriving in Rhode Island. And uh, not only did they uh, welcome me, but, um, you know, they... They tasked me. They, you know, I, I got a job, uh, and and they, you know, they said, get on this, uh, see what, see what you could do, do some research, find out what's happening in other states, and uh, and so that's how that's how it started, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's probably uh, how we met. Yeah, was that telephone? Call. That's my recollection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, you'll see, and I won't rehearse it now, but the struggle to translate public anger over the, the uh, judicial scandal 
and the patronage that was going on in the court. And what Michael mentioned, the secret account. It, um, you remember that they were converting the, the bar association uh, uh, fees into a slush fund, and they multiplied the amount that they charged each applicant for the bar, and they were using it for trips to the Red Sox and for a portrait of the Chief Justice and for repairing debts in the court clerk's car. And I mean, there, it was, there were things that as they came out infuriated people. And also, the one that really struck me was here's the Chief Justice writing letters to judges, chief judges or judges in the other courts saying, Dear Joe, you know, whatever the judge's first name is, so and so is, a, you know, a relative and this and that, and all the explanation, and maybe you could let him off easy. Signed, Thomas F. Fay, Chief Justice. <laughs> now, if that isn't an effective intimidation, there is nothing that would intimidate me more than that because the Chief Justice was the head of the whole judicial system. And uh, talk about having, like the CEO, uh, so it was an immense power. And so all this is coming out, hour by hour. And fortunately, we already had a coalition that had worked in the, in, on the RISTIC crisis. And you'll hear more about that next week. We had to flip the order because Michael has a, chief, has a federal judge coming to the law school next week. But that's all right. So um, we tried to translate the public anger into an amendment to the Constitution, which the legislature had resisted enacting for several years. And the, so the Bar Association and Common Cause were the prime movers of that. Um, and uh, Operation Clean Government came in on it and was very helpful. Uh, and that, that's really what happened. So um, we got the, the, the legislation passed in the spring of 1994, uh, and the, the Judicial Selection Panel was established for all the lower courts by law, but the Supreme Court would still have to go to the voters in November, and that, uh, so there's struggle about that, and you'll see that in the, in the chapters. Um, but, but as soon as that Judicial Nominating Commission began to work, one of its crucial responsibilities was to adopt its own rules for the process, and we needed to have somebody who would be on top of that, and I don't know how many dozens of hours you put in but Michael went to all the meetings and kept notes, and maybe you would describe that process a little bit. That was really fascinating, um, and uh, I was single at the time. I <laughs> didn't thing. have much to do. Uh, <laughs> I was new in the community, uh, so I did. I went to every meeting of the newly formulated uh, JNC, and I think what a lot of people didn't anticipate uh, was that there were very consequential decisions that they had to make to implement this legislation. The legislation only went so far as to create the commission and to, and to say you've got to provide to the governor three to five names for every vacancy and we talked a little bit about how the, how the uh, commission would be populated uh, the composition of the commission, but um, I just made a quick list um, this morning of the kinds of things that the JNC had to resolve before and during uh, the first wave of vacancies that they had to fill. And one other just interesting side note is that because this legislation was working its way through um, the system, there were a lot of judicial vacancies backed up so that when the JNC arrived with its new powers, um, there were eight or nine vacancies that they needed to fill. So they had to, they had to get it together pretty quickly. So things like how are we going to advertise for vacancies? How widely should we, can we um, uh, advertise for vacancies? Um, what should the application 
look like? How much information do we need about these people to decide uh, whether they're fit uh, to sit on the bench? Should we release the names of everybody who applies for a vacancy, or should we only release the names of the people that we pick to go to the second step um, in the process? Uh, how are we going to interview these people? Um, both substantively, what are we going to ask them, and uh, procedurally, are we, are we going to do them in public, uh, or are we going to do them privately? Um, how are we going to solicit input from individuals who might have something positive or negative to say about these um, applicants? Uh, and one of the really important ones that the statute was silent on uh, was uh, the voting process in the commission. Uh, how uh, would voting take place? Most importantly, um, would it take place in public? Would it be private? If it was private, would the results of the votes be disclosed or would we just get the names of those who uh, were put on the list of three to five. So um, we worked through all of that uh, during kind of a, uh, um, an intense series of, of meetings. Um, and, and on many of the issues, there was um, a good deal of um, disagreement among members of the commission uh, and among those who were watching and paying attention and cared about uh, how this how this new entity was going to uh, was going to operate, so um, some of them you know, were the, not the, happy. The devil in the detail. The devil was in the detail. Some of them were not happy to have you there. No, I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, at the very first meeting, um, uh, one of the commissioners said to the chair who is this person, or why is this person here, and um, I think, was Mike Kelly the first chair, yeah. or yeah, um, Mike Kelly said, kind of um, uh, reluctantly said, I think he's got a right to be here, um, so, and uh, he was right, um, and, uh, and, and on the one hand, there were people who were not happy to see me there. On the other hand, um, again, because this was all just happening for the first time, there weren't really any rules, um, they let me comment on a lot of stuff. I, we, we submitted a lot of material to them uh, on many of these issues um, with Common Cause's uh, position on uh, voting, for example. We wanted voting to be a public process, um, and um, many of them did not. Uh, and some so states do not have public votes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, I, I think as I recall, the, um, the conversations we were having at Common Cause, um, there was this recognition that, well, maybe we didn't want people to have to vote in public because they'd be subject to pressure um, or be reluctant to vote against somebody who might ultimately become a judge. And a number of the uh, members of the JNC were practicing lawyers. Um, so it wasn't a, immediately clear to anybody that public voting made the most sense. I think our sense at Common Cause was um, that this process had been so private for so long that it was really important for it to be as transparent as, as possible. And so I think almost at every turn um, with respect to these issues, that was our, um, uh, that, that, that was our motivating principle, I think. Uh, make, make, it, make it public, release names, invite people to testify in favor or against uh, applicants, do the interviews publicly. And, um, and that's how most of it happens now. Mo um, there hasn't been much retrenchment on 
many of those initial decisions that right. the commission made. Um, so that was uh, that was truly fascinating. Uh, probably better than dating, uh, which is what <laughs> I could have, well, <laughs> theoretically could have been doing with my time. Uh, but probably, in fact, wouldn't have. You alluded there have been a number of efforts to undermine merit selection of judges. Um, maybe um, in my in, in the in the afterward of the book, I say that I think that in in some ways this was the least effective of the reforms that we worked on, because there was such an aggressive effort to undermine it. And I'll just mention two, and then you may have some comments about them and the larger context, always the Speaker and Senate President uh, put lobbyists or law partners onto the Commission. And so th it was, there was direct influence that continued. So that was a problem from the beginning. A second thing that, that I saw was that Governors never liked, no governor, not Bruce Sunland, not Link Almond, not Don Kachiri, none of them liked the requirement that the commission present to the governor a list of three to five highly qualified candidates for each vacancy. It was very tightly written that way into the statute and into the Constitution eventually. Um, and they hated it. They kept looking for ways to get around it. And the year after I retired, they passed legislation that would allow the governor a look-back window. So anybody who had approved, been approved for a vacancy on that court in three previous years could be considered for the vacancy. So that suddenly the short list was just blown out of the water. And then finally, they started to create magistrates who would be appointed by the chiefs of the court without the, the uh, Judicial Nominating Commission scrutiny. And they went from about two or three magistrates in 1994 to 20-some now. So they have created these alternate judges who look like judges and act like judges and do a lot of the same things that ju judges do. Get paid like judges. Get paid judges. like judges. <laughs> Uh, but are, don't have to go through the process, and who then come back and say, look what a great job I've done as a magistrate, now make me a judge. Um, so there has been a, a systematic and aggressive attempt to undermine this process. I wonder if you'd comment about, uh, and to me that's been a great discouragement, because it's been so cynical, and we have never been able to generate the kind of public outcry about it that made a difference in the beginning, but... Yeah, so uh, I guess one of the things I learned uh, in this process was that um, you can... you can draw up as nice a process as, um, as you possibly can in terms of making compromises, but um, sometimes the effectiveness of the process depends on uh, though on the actors acting in good faith, sure. and um, everybody, I think, uh, as, as as Phil mentioned, everybody who was affected by this process um, tried in some way to game it, and um, that's the nature of politics, and. Um, you know, I think in some ways the reform may have been oversold. Um, you know, I think people thought this would be the end of uh, political patronage or the end of political influence, and um, that just doesn't happen with um, selection of, of judges. These are particularly in Rhode Island. Um, because there, there are some unique aspects of the Rhode Island judiciary, particularly in Rhode Island, these are plumb positions, uh, regardless of the court, and this is from the um, traffic tribunal up to the Supreme Court, these are lifetime appointments. Um, and uh, with very generous uh, pensions. So, 
legislators uh, who control this process for the most part, um, they don't want to give these away. Uh, so they've done a number of things, as, as, as Phil mentioned, um, to try to make sure they have as much influence as possible and the governor has done as much uh, as he or she could to make sure that uh, he or she has the most uh, influence possible. And it runs the gamut from uh, appointments to the JNC uh, and there, in, in addition to who's being appointed um, and whether they're just doing the bidding of the Speaker of the House, for example, who gets one appointment or the majority leader in the Senate who gets one appointment, uh, or the Senate president. Um, are, are they doing that person's bidding? That's one issue. The other issue is that um, the statute calls for them to serve four years on the JNC with no reappointment, uh, so one term of four years. Uh, there, there are individuals on the JNC now who have served upwards of eight years. People, they don't get replaced, and the statute says that until a replacement is named, you stay on. So we've got these, you know, uh, folks who are just living on the JNC, um, and, and I'm told in deliberations, assert uh, and I don't know how convincing they are, but assert expertise, right? I, I'm better at this than you newbie JNC member because I've been doing this for seven years uh, and you've been doing it for one. Uh, and, and I think there's something that uh, symbolically, I, I think that it's, it, it has hurt the process and undermined confidence in the process um, that there are examples like that of flagrant violation of, violations of the rules. That's one. Another one is the, the governor is supposed to pick from the list, not supposed to, the governor shall pick from the list within 30 days. No governor has come close to 30 days, uh, right from the beginning. And I think there's a list for uh, Governor Raimondo now that's probably been, I think, preceded her um, election. Uh, so there, there, there are lists that stay up there for months and months. Uh, and the... Explain the problem of that. So, in addition to just the lawlessness of it, which I do think has an influence uh, on people. They say, come on, you know, nobody's playing by the rules here. Um, but the, the more vacancies the governor has to fill, the easier it is for the governor to make deals, right? The more chips you have, uh, the more likely you are to be able to say, all right, I'll give you this one if you give me this one. Uh, and there's reason to believe that um, that what well, not not only is there reason to believe that happened, we know that happened. Um, Governor Chafee, after uh, he left office, acknowledged that he was under a tremendous amount of pressure from the then speaker, I guess Gordon Fox, mm -hmm. uh, to name. Uh, Joseph Montalbano, who had been a former member of the House Senate. Uh, of the Senate, um, to the bench. Uh, and uh, Governor Chafee didn't want to name Montalbano to the bench. Uh, and uh, Fox told him, you know, you can make a decision. You can not appoint Montalbano, and I will do my best to gum up any legislative agenda you have, uh, or you can appoint Montalbano and things will go easier for you. And Governor Chafee said he appointed Montalbano and things got easier for him. Uh, so uh, I give him a tremendous amount of credit for, um, for granting that interview and, and talking about that. And uh, so, you know, there, there, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of stuff going on. Um, and the magistrates, I, I do not understand why we haven't been able to make progress um, uh, on the magistrates. It's, it's uh, 
clearly an end run. As Phil mentioned, the number went from 2 to 20 uh, in a couple of years. Uh, and, and, it, and it is this double trouble. One, they get, to, they get their appointments outside the JNC process. And here you've seen some really pure patronage appointments. Um, the former speaker's wife, for example, became a magistrate. And then when they apply for lifetime appointments on the bench and they come before the JNC, um, not only can they say, I've been doing this job and doing this job well for a number of years, but their judicial colleagues come and say that. So the chief of the court will sometimes testify in favor of a magistrate on his or her court and say, uh, I know this person can do the job because this person's been doing the job and um, and doing the job well. So, you know, we've we've tried on that one, and nobody seems to uh, to. I, I, you know, no, we're not getting any traction on it. Well, and the, the sponsor on the <coughs> House side, first in the Senate, and then the House side, Donna Walsh from Charlestown who put in legislation to require the magistrates to go through the judicial selection process, she was gerrymandered out of her seat in 2002. She then ran for the House and was elected to the House and put the legislation in again. And then the leadership put up someone to run against her who defeated her uh, with some leadership support. So you begin to realize that this is a very unwelcome recommendation and that if you recommend this, you're going to be in trouble with the leadership. So having them try to put you out of the chamber is only the most blatant thing. There are a lot of much less blatant things. I think we've gone on long enough. How about some questions from you? Go ahead. I have a question because I'm an attorney and I have, I have had contact with courts in several states. Has anybody got a better system? I mean, I worked for a Superior Court judge in Massachusetts who was brilliant and is now on the federal bench, but she had to have political connections. And she certainly merit would have done it. I mean, absolutely brilliant, honestly, judge. But if she hadn't had connections with the Kennedy family, she wouldn't be on the bench. And I, when I was a child, one of my father's first cousins was a common police court judge in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And I, so I learned as a child that the way you became a judge was you, was you had to have connections. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, is any, does any state do a better job than Massachusetts and Rhode Island and every place else I've ever been? <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's such a great question. And, and I do think that um, people have to be realistic about uh, the influence of politics on judicial selection. Um, the you know, the options, and, and what's interesting is, is you've described two systems that are different from each other and different from Rhode Island's. So Pennsylvania uh, elects its judges, um, and, you know, we could talk a lot about the downsides um, uh, to that. Um, in Mass Massachusetts is more like, although they do have a nominating commission, but it's more like the federal system where the executive appoints and the Senate confirms. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the JNC. But so, so the, federal, the federal model, I think, is the one that people often point to and say, you know, that, that seems to be working well. We get good federal judges for the most part. But you're absolutely right. Um, the, those judges uh, are on the bench because they, as Scott McKay likes to say, um, uh, they know a senator. And uh, I, for example, I, I think Jack McConnell is as good a judge as we could possibly hope to have on the federal district court here in Rhode Island. But there's no, but there's no doubt that Jack McConnell doesn't get that job unless he's close to uh, the congressional uh, delegation. So. Um, what I, I, I guess for me the system part of the failure of this system is that um, people lack 
the political will to do something about it um, when, and call it out uh, when they see it and hold legislators accountable. But, you know, when you think about the kinds of things voters, mo that motivate voters, um, for those of us who aren't lawyers, it turns out judicial selection is like pretty low on their list. Um, with the exception, with the exception perhaps of the United States Supreme Court. I mean, I think people realize, for example, that this election matters in terms of the composition of the Supreme Court and they care about that. But I think at the state level, people don't care about judges that much. Go ahead, and then and Joe. Would you comment upon about the recent appointment of Richard Leach to the, to the judiciary? Yeah, so... Does everybody hear Richard Leach is the question. Former senator, lieutenant governor, director of administration. So a guy with a long resume of, of government service in different positions. Um, I think the... So there, were, there was... There was a preliminary issue with Richard Leach, which was whether he was subject to the revolving door law that would okay. prohibit him from even being an applicant. Uh, and the, he sought an advisory uh, opinion from the Ethics Commission, uh, and they said that because of the nature of his job, uh, he was not subject to the revolving door. Um, and then his appointment, um, you know, I, I, I think he's a, I think he's a very smart man. I, I've heard that he's a, a very good judge, um, and I think again, um, Governor Chafee felt like there weren't going to be political ramifications uh, for appointing someone who was an insider. Um, so. You know, they did it the right way. Let me put it. Let me put it that way. <coughs> Seeking the advisory opinion was the right thing to do. And once he got the advisory opinion, then it was uh, fair game. Joe, and then Mark. I gather, being fairly new to Rhode Island, you had two cases of chief justices being removed or resigning in fairly short order, which precipitated the interest of common cause to to get into this issue. Is there any evidence to show that the system is more fair or more just since the changes have been implemented, even with its imperfections? So we had a symposium um, 15 years after, so uh, it w what would that make it, 2008? 2009. Yeah, 2008, 2009. Um, and we invited folks from all over the country and people who studied this uh, issue and... Um, at the law school. At the law school. And um, I guess I'd summarize the, the findings sort of this way. Um, anecdotally, we haven't had a scandal like that. Um, where there have been judges who have misbehaved um, but not as a product of too cozy a relationship with the legislature. I think that, that was really, I think, the prime mover of this, was to try to wrest con complete control uh, of judicial appointments from the legislature, particularly on the, on the Supreme Court. Um, so... Our Supreme Court has our Supreme Court has been clean as a whistle. I think it's fair to say. Um, in terms of who's being named, uh, what we have what we found, at least in the first fifteen years, is that there were fewer uh, judges being named who had experience in the General Assembly. Um, and it was, and, and the difference was statistically significant. Um, so if that was the primary objective, there's some evidence to suggest that we, we made some progress. Uh, we made some progress on that. But I think there's a tremendous amount of cynicism uh, 
uh, out there about about the reform because I think what what we saw in the beginning started to dissipate, and that was a whole bunch of lawyers without <coughs> political connections applying to the JNC. <coughs> And there were one or two who made it through. And I remember us being so excited that a guy named Kent Williver, um, who knew nobody, um, made it through. And, but he wasn't selected, but he, but he made a list. Uh, and then what happened was uh, people have sort of selected out of the process. They look at it and they say, you know what, I don't have a chance. Uh, so I'm not going to apply, because if I apply um, and I get to the next step, my name becomes public, my clients know I'm thinking about closing up my law practice, my partners know I'm thinking about closing up my law practice, and if I have a snowball's chance in hell, why would I do that to myself? So that, that the number of people who have applied for vacancies has decreased, and that's sad. And you'll get to the story uh, of Margaret Curran, you haven't gotten to it yet in the book, but who was nominated in 1997 to, uh, by Governor Almond, and was, because she would not commit to the House and Senate leadership, and we'll talk about this when Bob Flanders is here, um, but because she would not commit to, quote, be safe, unquote, on separation of powers, they trashed her nomination very publicly. Uh, and then nominated Maureen McKenna Goldberg, who um, was, had direct political connections and went the other way. So I think experiences like that uh, offended people because it, it really just was wrong. There was another question. Um, uh, Mark and then Clint, and, and then we'll probably have to stop. And then I, I want to say one thing about Meg Curran. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, I guess I wanted to say one thing because it's in following to what you guys were just, just talking about. I practiced between 1979 uh, and 2012. So I did like 14 years under one and then 20 years under, mm -hmm. under the other. And the political stuff did, didn't really seem to change very much. But Two things that were important to me were the, the courtroom management was a lot room better, was a lot better under the new system. The judges came in and had some concept of what was going on, some <laughs> idea about what the, the rule of law had. Because it was like, you know, it's like they've, well, anyway. so, so that. <laughs> good, even, that's that good. Even, so I felt like <laughs> that, even, at least at the Superior Court trial level. And, and, and part of it, and another part of that was, it was like automatically, we quit having judicial conferences all of the time. Because that you never went to court and, and put anything on the record. That people would stand up and identify all the parties present, and every, you know, somebody would always ask for a conference. Well, there was a conference in the judges' chambers, nine and a half times out of ten, no stenographer or anything, so you just sort of shot the breeze. And you could tell who you walked in with how it was going to go, because we're buddies with the judge. That stopped. So those, those were two pretty good. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Clint, and then we'll make that the last question, I think. The, the cynic in me. Um, I, I observed more, recent, more recently, um, first of all, Governor Romando appeared to try to circumvent the uh, revolving door laws when she hired Donna Lally, a former le lawyer legislator. And, uh, and then she was going to appoint Tim bench. Williamson to the bench. Well, that, that's, that's my main question, yeah. I didn't, but I just wanted to put that in there too. But I don't even know what happened to Lally, but for those that may not know, she was going to hire this former legislator with an under a year from leaving in violation of the uh, revolving door law if you were going to get a state job. But she gave him a job in her administration, which was technically outside of that parameter, and then loaned him to a state agency. So he circumvented it. More recently, the, the case of Tim Williamson, and I just, you know, I haven't been involved, in, and I don't know what's going on fully, so what I've been reading with, on several levels, uh, in my opinion, he did not qualify to be a judge. And uh, it seemed like the fix was in. 
and he, there was a lot of pressure to get him on that list. And, but then I don't know what happened. I guess he didn't get it. Well, the good news is she didn't pick him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she she picked somebody else, and she acknowledged, um, at least off the record, that she was getting a tremendous amount of pressure to pick him. Um, yeah. And the the General Assembly still has enough juice to get people that they want on the list. I think the, the Tim Williamson should should not have been on the list for. A host of reasons. Uh, it, was, it was an embarrassment, frankly, that he was on the list. Right. Um, but um, but she did the right thing, uh, and so he's. But I think, but for some of that pressure, probably you know, the press got a lot of it, which is another reason why we we have to figure out how we're going to have a strong press. Yes. But, uh, uh, but for that pressure, I think it might have you know happened. I, I observed many times that. If uh, there isn't a lot of outcry about something, it's much easier to vote for it and let it go through. Yeah, and you're right. There was on there was on Williamson. Yeah. Pe people people were talking about it, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the good, that's one of the positives of the process. If um, that she would have had to do that in public, you know, pick him right. from that list, and uh, I guess she, and she decided that that would have been too high a price to pay. Are we ever good. going to correct the? Laws in the system, or is it just we have to go along floundering where we do and taking some of the benefits that Mark talked about? Um, I think some. Uh, I think at the margins, some of these issues are are likely to improve. Um, but you know, the thing that's going to be hard to undo that is at the heart of a lot of this is the representation of surrogates from the General Assembly on the JNC. Um, and I don't think there's any chance really to blow that up, although I have heard um, that there are folks in the executive branch who, are, who say they're willing to talk about it. And I, and I think the way that they would do it is not to remove the legislators, but to make the JNC bigger um, in order to reduce their influence, their relative influence. So we come back to the place that we so often do of recognizing that the government we have is our creation. And imperfect as we are imperfect and hopefully getting a little better incrementally but not quite getting to the point where we can say this is really really good um, but um, I look back on that reform as something of a discouragement uh, and you will see in the afterward where I've listed the magistrates and their connections mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's a frustration, uh, but it's a change. And you'll also see some of the struggle, if you haven't read it already, uh, to, to get there. And I, but I thank you for your, for your time. That's no, my uh, pleasure. To, to, my uh, but not just this morning, but for all that you've done over the years. And, That's uh, been my pleasure, too. Um, so let me just tell you one thing about him that uh, <laughs> impacted me tremendously. Um, it, I think it was around the time of Meg Kern's um, uh, her appearance before the House. I think House was first. Um, I I was so disheartened. It was it was appalling what they did to her. Um, she was a former. U.S. Attorney, she had argued hundreds of cases before the United States Court of Appeals, uh, and all they did was hector her with questions about how many arguments have you had in the Rhode Island State Courts, and you know, just belittling her uh, um, her qualifications, uh, and waiting until then Attorney General Whitehouse uh, and. And Bruce Selya, who might be the most respected 
judge in Rhode Island um, testified on her behalf. They left, and then the trouble started. Her kids were there, her husband was there, it was horrible. And I remember calling Phil, yeah, I either called Phil that night or I saw him and soon thereafter and I said, I, I, I hate those people. I can't, believe, I can't believe they did that. I hate those people. And he said to me, um, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, right? This is a line you probably use with some frequency or did that. And, and I remember saying, well, how about temporary enemies? I, I at least have temporary enemies. And he reluctantly agreed to let me have temporary enemies. But, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons he was and is as successful uh, as he is, um, that you have to remain buoyant uh, and, and have to uh, live another day to... Uh, uh, to keep making progress and, and try not to get try not to get discouraged and, and angry, but uh, that boy that night I wish I had been nice dating. On your behalf, from the school hosting Phil and the panel what was it, two years ago now at the law school for that evening on the the book release. Yeah, that was really book fun. It was a great evening. Yeah, that was like a uh, uh, sort of a coming a homecoming for all of the. Folks who were involved. It was really great, I know, to, to see as many people, as many of the people that you mentioned in that book in the same room. Yeah. So. Let's take a break for 10 minutes and. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet.